chunk of energy from you. And so, for example, on the film side, every shot that we want to get as we're going down the river, we have to get everyone to wait on the side of the shore. Myself and my filmmaker partner will paddle down the river, pull up the tripod, set up the camera, set up the mics, um, make sure we're rolling, then we'll radio up to the crew and be like, okay, paddle pass. And then we'll just film and paddle for pass. And then you pack up your stuff, get back in the boat, and paddle forward. And it's this exhausting, exhausting, grueling um, thing. You feel like you're doing the trip twice based off of the amount of equipment you're carrying. And so this is just an example of uh, some of the terrain. So on the trip, there's an eight kilometer portage. And that portage, which you'll see in the film, takes multiple days, 32 trips. And this is the start of that portage. So we had several GoPro cameras um, with us that were attached to all the canoes in addition to our, our film cameras. Um, so in this case, we had tipped the camera upside down and strapped it to the front of the canoe. And this is uh, my partner, Emma Hodson, who is the lead field scientist on the trip. Um, and this is how you portage those boats. So the landscape is this, is this incredibly rugged and beautiful um, rocky outcroppings that cut out into the river. And then in the background, those rapids in the background, they're hard to tell, but they're about class four, class five, these very massive, um, they would definitely flip your canoe if you're trying to go through them. Um, and so you have difficulties like that of just the sheer energy and time suck. And then for us on the, um, in some of the more beautiful places where we need to nail down a specific shot that's, that's just um, an incredibly beautiful portion of the river where this landscape only exists in this one section of river, um, we would spend a lot of time setting up the shots so that they'd be successful. So this is an example of setting up the GoPro, we're clearing off the canoes, getting all the hammock helmets out of the way, and then you can get some shots like this. Then you'd have challenges with the equipment. So uh, because you're on this river, we were on the trip on the river for 20 days, and uh, you have issues with batteries. So all your camera batteries, we had dozens and dozens of camera batteries, and we also had a fleet of um, solar panels that would charge. We laid them out over the canoe, and they charged into these battery packs. But then we had a stretch of two weeks where there was just no sun. It was either rainy or cloudy. And there's an interview later on in the film where. Um, the entire thing was shot holding the drone because that was the only battery left that worked using the GoPro camera on the bottom, so we're just like holding it like this. Um, and then when you're using the drone, you're so far north that the drone is communicating with its controller, um, but it, it starts to get confused with the North Pole and the, and the magnetic north, uh, interrupting your signal feed between the remote control and the drone. So we would have times, that shot that we just showed, um, of the canoe going down river, that was one successful shot, and thank God we got it, because the next shot, uh, the drone, instead of reading the controller, read magnetic north and just tilted and went boom, and just like disappeared into the woods, and we spent two hours tracking it down, broke propellers, uh, it was terrible. But you're able to get shots like this, and we were able to pull together a story. And so um, the logistics of filming were incredibly tough, but um, the reason why we wanted to do this and why we wanted to pick artists who had to struggle in their mediums in this kind of environment is because artists are just storytellers and they pick different mediums for um, the to express the type of language that they can't put to the feeling that they're 
that they're trying to express or the story they're trying to tell or the commentary they're trying to give. And so the idea with this was that if we could get a group of six storytellers together, create a film and put them into this landscape, they will then go back into the studio and create works that are based on this trip. And the energy of this space and the story of the Peel Watershed will get to continue to ripple out um, through all of their future work and all of their future gallery shows. Um, the structure of the film was such that we did the 20-day canoe trip, and then the artists, artists did have a year left, uh, back in the studio to create works. And we flew around to each of their studios in the, in the different parts of Canada um, to watch them creating the works that they were going to do. And then we put together an exhibition. So the exhibition and the film are sort of traveling around around Canada as a, as a duo. Um, the art right now is in southern Ontario. Luckily, the film can be here. Um, so that's where we're at. But what came out of this, based off of the, the amount of uh, emotional impact that this trip had on the artists and how much it rooted their work into um, a theme that seems like it's going to be continued to last, and last for a couple of years, we actually turned this into an artist residency. So what exists now is uh, the Canadian Wilderness Artist Residency, um, where each year we take a new group of 10 artists out into the field um, and we do um, the artist paddle for uh, 15 days down the Yukon River up to Dawson City in Yukon, uh, where they join in with the Riverside Arts Festival there for three days before heading back home. Um, and the impact that these folks had up in the Peel watershed is still being seen throughout this artist residency. So it's now it's in its fourth year of operation. Um, and these folks just get to head out via crew. We've had dancers, we've had photographers, musicians, um, and they get to explore some of the old ruins on, on the river. So cool. Yeah. Um, and the last video I'll show here is just from that residency. So outside of this work with the film and with the artist residency, um, I'm an outdoor educator and I work with youth ages 4 to 17. Um, but my passion is being drawn in this direction because what I'm finding is that for folks who are like 13, 14, 15, up to maybe 25 or so, the ability for um, two things. One, the ability to get out into an area um, of a tech wilderness like this where you feel vulnerable and you feel like you're going through struggles, but you feel like you're able to do that as part of a team. Um, that is is vulnerable and it's and it draws out certain types of emotion that they don't often get to tap into when they work in a city and they live in a city. Um, and then the other thing is that art is this it's this like a, a calm what am I trying to say? It's like it's it grounds the noise, it can dampen down the noise. And so when you're going through your teen years and you have, you're have struggling with all these anxieties and you're trying to figure life out and you're trying to figure out who you are uh, often um, based off of who your peers are and you're trying to gauge yourself off of their judgments and their acceptances and, and you're going through life with that, um, it's often hard to tamp down the noise and find out who you are and feel some confidence in that. And so art has, a, art has the ability to um, root all of that, that um, 
vulnerability and feeling fragile and feeling like you're trying to figure things out into something concrete, into some point of pride of, I created this, I did this, and this is my, you know, you, you know when you're creating and you get into that tunnel vision of like, this is, this is where all my energy is going right now. Having teens be able to tap into that energy is just, it's incredible, it's freeing. And so um, the next stage with the artist residency is to run a youth-based program, but um, that's it, that's, that's where my work lies. So uh, outdoor education with youth and hopefully going in this direction, and then we run the artist residency, and then this film will continue doing its tour. So that's it, but I want to leave room for any questions and things like that. I'm excited to see your film, because just seeing the previews is just incredible. Like just what the adventures that the artists went through, like you guys went through, mm -hmm. like it's something I would, I'm not the best with nature, but I'm just happy to see that you guys had an opportunity to go over um, the part of Canada. It's just incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And, and honestly, half of the group had, had never camped before, had never been before. <laughs> yeah. And so that was a challenge. And then the other part was we left in September. Um, and the reason we left in September into the Arctic was. Um, the Tetlikwichin had upriver to uh, do a moose hunting um, season in ceremony every single year, and so we wanted to coincide with that that um, hunting uh, hunting gathering. But you'll find it early in the film, like it, it snowed, it hailed, like it was like. And when you've never been camping before, that can be your anxiety can be up here. So that's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. City slickers. City slickers. Yeah, Toronto, Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary. And one Montreal would come back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Where are you from originally? I'm from Grimsby, Ontario. Those are my parents, by the way. Okay. Yay. Um, <laughs> Grimsby, Ontario, near Hamilton, Niagara Falls, yeah. and I live in Vancouver now. Yeah. We got to pick them up because you know they have guns. Yeah, yeah, these guys pick us up. So. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. We're over. Over. yeah. We're over. Awesome. Great. What are you doing in here? In Tucker, Toronto. Space and I think you know that's that's part of what I love about that yeah, um, taking people out to the wilderness specifically if they haven't been there before or if they have been there before doing something that does push them out of their limits is um, I you can run a trip successfully in a way that makes people feel safe like Maslow's hierarchy of needs in terms of I need food shelter water and then I'm, I can be pretty okay as long as we can line those things up well which we did on the trip for the most part <laughs> then. It, it can just be a, it can be a life altering thing. So I hope you do. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Awesome. So as an artist yourself, then what challenge? I mean, there were clearly a, a ton of challenges that you mm -hmm. ran into. But then, how did it stretch your own sort of art form or your own practice from having to organize them, create your art, and yeah. sort of be the overarching umbrella of the whole thing? This this was uh, my first film, so I had done a bunch of videography and and. It's an easy one for your first. I film. know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> So honestly, that was the challenge. This this whole idea started back in 2010 with um, where myself as a guy just wanted to take out my artistic friends and he'd go into Algonquin or do something like that and just do some sort of like quote unquote staunchly Canadian kind of trip um, and wrestle with that as a theme and then I would just get to sit back and watch my friends make art. And I actually started to plan that and then one by one they were just like, oh, I can't work and they dropped out like flies. Um, and then it sat on the shelf, and I did a year where I just went to go and I've been working straight with Outdoor Ed for so long that I took a year to go and paddle in all these different places that I'd always wanted to. Ended up in the Peel Watershed, it's the last place that I was. And I was like, okay, if I, if I ever do that, it has to be here. This is this landscape, it's just incredible, and, and what's going on here is incredible. Um, and then Tony is my best friend, we went to high school together and, and grew up together. And so I came back and was like, listen, would you actually, would you want to do this in, in a real way? And then we were like, great, let's put out a call for artists. And then the film came second. So the film was like, well, we might as well like, film it. <laughs> yeah, but we do. And then it slowly snowballed from there. So 
my experience over the past decade has been on organizing these trips, but not on the film side. So that was my biggest struggle was like, I knew I could safely guide this trip and be on this trip and and I, I know storytelling uh, to, to at least a decent degree. So I knew I could pull something out no matter what we caught, but um, I didn't expect the how tired we were and how much like physical work it took to lug all that camera equipment. So we had a, a Blackmagic cinema camera, a 6D, four GoPros and a drone, and then all the batteries and the solar panels and the things. So you had like five Pelican cases, and then you also had uh, this laptop um, with a whole suite of drives because you, you have to dump your data at the end of the day. So every single day we would film all day, come back at nighttime, and then as people are crawling into bed, we're sitting in the dark with headlamps just like downloading data. So that, that was the hardest thing. So many drives that way. Oh, so many drives. Yeah. And using these kind of mics, um, you would have the, a wireless pickup right in the middle of the boat in a dry bag, and then everybody's just wearing lapel mics on their raincoats and things like that. But trying to, I'm, on guiding trips, I'm used to getting people set up in the morning, let's cook breakfast, let's get in the boats, but this is like all that plus, okay, who needs a mic? Where's your, let me fix your, do audio tests? Like, it was crazy. So, yeah. yeah. Have, the, uh, have many said that they were going to? Uh, go see Parks Canada this summer because um, there's free entry with the one hundred right. one fifty. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, have many of the artists yeah. said that they're going to do that? Or have uh, like you shown the film in other places? Yeah, we showed. So we showed the film. It premiered at Water Docks in Toronto, um, and then we also showed it. So what we actually did to make the full film was we put together a rough cut of it, just the trip, and then we screened it in Calgary with a bunch of the art, and then we filmed that event for the final version of the film. And so it, an early version screened in Calgary, and then before we showed it, the final version of the film anywhere else, we did a Yukon tour of the film and the art to go back out to all the communities that supported us originally and get their feedback and, and say, did we represent this issue uh, in a way that feels honest to you? And so we went through Yukon and, and up to Northwest Territories and Fort McPherson, um, made some tweaks from that, but the feedback was great, and then showed it in Toronto, and now it's sort of like halfway through this tour, so. Um, but those artists have, have continued on, so Tony has now gone up to Labrador and Northwest Territories and done a bunch of other trips for, with his career and also his music. Um, they're all sort of wrestling with it in their own ways and getting out for Canada 150 and National Parks, yeah. Where did you get your funding? How did you do that? Yeah, so we, we got 20000 from Canada Council um, and we, we raised 30000 And so that was our, that 50000 uh, paid for everything up until the end of the trip. So the camera equipment, the flights going up there, um, rental of canoes, guide fees, all that. But then all of the post production was just like myself and Tony just, <laughs> we're in still in a minute that Yeah, so it was like a year and a half. Just like, okay, we got we got a thousand bucks. Okay, let's fly to Calgary and film those guys. Okay, so yep. just one, one more.